Welcome to this Cage Prisoners event. My name is Asim Qureshi and I will be your chair for this evening. I'm uh, the research director at Cage Prisoners and you know, we'd all like to wel wel welcome you very warmly. This is the first of a series of seminars that we're hoping to run as part of our, our legal committee within Cage Prisoners. Um, and the first topic that we've chosen today is preserving the rule of law. And where better to, to hold such an event than the Bingham Room? Uh, especially after his wonderful book that he wrote quite recently. And definitely, if you haven't read it yet, you should. It's wonderful. Um, I'd like to thank Gray's Inn for hosting us in this beautiful room, but also to Nine Bedford Road for uh, helping to, to acquire the room for us. Now, in terms of my guests, it is my absolute privilege to be hosting this austere panel. To my immediate left is Sir Geoffrey Beinman, uh, who started the firm Bindman's, um, which began in 1974, and they've been involved in human rights cases really ever since. He was the former chair of the British Institute for Human Rights up until only two months ago, and famously represented a number of high-profile human rights cases, particularly Pinochet, well, against Pinochet, should I add. <laughs> then to his left is Sagir Hussain, who's a criminal lawyer specializing in counterterrorism cases, um, he's also a board member for Cage Prisoners. To my right is David Gottlieb. Not uh, politically. Sorry? Not politically. Not politically. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Absolutely. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here. Um, who is a barrister at Thomas More Chambers, um, who is one of the leading trial lawyers in the country. He just represented Salma Kabal, the wife of uh, a convicted terrorism suspect, who um, quote him as being extremely inspirational to the press. And then, last but not least, Toby Cadman, uh, who is a barrister at Nine Bedford Row, specialising in international law, human rights cases, and terrorism cases as well. Uh, he's famously appeared before the ICTY, sorry, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, as well as, uh, more recently, the International Crimes Tribunal in Bangladesh. So, I welcome all of our guests, and we are going to begin with Jeffrey Beinman. I thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak in, on this occasion and um, I congratulate Cage Prisoners for uh, putting on this seminar and for devoting it to the most essential topics that we can possibly discuss, um, especially in the Bingham Room. Uh, that is to say the preservation uh, of the rule of law. And. Um, I think it's often forgotten that the rule of law uh, and the various subsidiary principles that come out of the rule of law, such as equality before the law, um, the respect for human dignity which is embodied uh, in the rule of law, they are all aspects of human rights. I mean, human rights is essentially about those qualities, those uh, attributes which every human being is entitled to have respected and where necessary to have enforced by the law. Uh, and so I would like to talk about human rights, it's something I've been interested in virtually all my career, in fact, since before anyone really talked about human rights. I mean, human rights is now so commonly talked about and written about it that if you go into any law library, you will find a whole bookcase of books on human rights, but actually there were virtually no books on human rights when I started uh, practice, and, and human rights has developed um, as a subject of interest to lawyers, really, only uh, since the Second World War. Um, you'll be hearing about more detailed aspects of human rights later in this seminar. I would like to be more general and stress the problem that we have at the moment is that Human rights are under attack, not 
only specific rights, not only in, in the details of legal processes, but the principles of human rights, the, the, the very idea that human rights is a subject which is central to the responsibility of the state. And it's very hard to understand how this has come about because after the Second World War, with all the horrors that took place then, the Holocaust and the murder of so many millions of people, um, there was a general consensus among the nations of the world that, first of all, that that should never happen again, but that in order to prevent it happening again and in order to prevent those violations and other violations of, of human dignity, there should be a legal framework throughout the world which should be enforceable. And, of course, the, the central notion of all this is that the world, uh, there is a global acceptance of the supremacy of human rights which needs to be brought down to the level of every citizen so that every citizen, every person can have those rights protected and where they are invaded or threatened. There is a mechanism and a remedy to enable redress to be secured against that invasion of rights. So what we have seen, and it's very hard to imagine how anybody could regard this as a, uh, an undesirable thing. It seems to me almost essential to being human, that one wants to have that kind of structure in which there will be the means for every person to establish, secure, defend, and, and have enforced his or her fundamental rights, the right not to be arrested without trial, the right of freedom of expression. Um, I, I needn't go through the, the, the list of human rights because they're all very well known to, um, to all of you. But that, uh, that system, that world system began I suppose, with the UN declaration, the formation of the United Nations uh, at the end of the Second World War, the Charter of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was adopted uh, in 1948 and promoted by the, the world leaders. And I'm not talking about politics here because this is not really, we're not really talking about <coughs> political partisanship here, or, or political parties, or, 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 or uh, taking sides, we're talking about a fundamental human principle, a, a basic, basic principles of uh, human existence, which were accepted and adopted by the vast majority of the world's nations, in fact, virtually all of them. Uh, and a framework was developed from 1948, which has got now to the point here where, as you all well know, you can go to court and you can refer to the Human Rights Act, which contains the, the list of human rights protected by the European Human Rights Convention, and you can ask the judge to enforce and implement those rights in your particular case. Now, to my mind, this is the, this is the height of civilized uh, behavior, if you like. It's something which we should all be immensely proud of. And there should be no dissent or disagreement among people, all of whom benefit from 
the, a system of the, in which their rights are protected, as to the value of having that system and the importance of defending it, promoting it, funding it if necessary, and so on, uh, making it work. And yet, in this country, uh, and in America, and, and other countries too, we have seen a vicious and dishonest, totally dishonest attack on human rights. Of course, the, the, the people who attack, attack human rights on the whole, they have, they have enough um, crude common sense, if you like, not to attack it head on. I mean, they will always say, of course, we love human rights, we, we, we support human rights. Nevertheless, there has been, in this country, probably uh, over a good few years now, a very severe and very uh, vicious uh, assault on, on, on human rights principles and on the very idea of having human rights protected uh, adequately by law. The, um, I don't know if, if people happen to see an article in uh, The Guardian just last week. Um, it was headed, Not in Amy's Name. It's a very sad article. It's written by a man called Paul Houston, whose daughter, teenage daughter, was killed by a, a man driving a car, knocked down by a car and killed. This is already about, uh, is now ten, nearly 10 years ago. Um, and the man who was driving the car had no license. Uh, he was driving dangerously. He mounted, his car mounted the pavement, she was killed. He was obviously enough prosecuted for various offences. He was sent to jail. And after he came out of jail, he carried on living here in a, in a normal way and eventually married, had children. Only several years later uh, did the Home Office decide that they, they should try to have him deported. He was not a UK citizen. Uh, he'd, he'd never obtained citizenship, although possibly he could have done. And uh, uh, he was threatened with deportation. The, the, the um, immigration tribunal and then the court said they accepted an argument from his uh, lawyers that under Article 8 of the Human Rights Convention, he was, uh, his family life would be invaded to such an extent by his deportation that they decided not to deport him. He had small children, he had a, a wife who was a UK citizen, brought up in, in Britain and so on. Now, one doesn't need to explore too closely the merits of the case or take or form a view as to whether the decisions were right or wrong. Uh, but it's pretty clear that had the Home Office sought his deportation uh, on his release from prison um, or his removal, they would have succeeded because at that time he had no family, he had no, no claim um, to, to remain here on Article 8 grounds. So it was pretty clear that the reason he was allowed to stay was that he um, the Home Office had failed to seek his removal at the appropriate time. 
In other words, it wasn't a criticism of the Human Rights Act or of the Human Rights Convention. Notwithstanding that, the, um, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, used this case as a stick to beat the Human Rights Act with and wrote to Mr. Houston saying he would ensure that the Human Rights Act would be repealed when the Tory government, when the Tories came into power, which um, let's hope they never do. Uh, and, uh, but that's the position of serious politicians in our country that they, first of all, it, it was simply a lie that this case was um, in some way, that this man's, the failure to deport this man was the fault of, the, of human rights, it was not. Um, and uh, this very, very uh, sad article in The Guardian last week is from the father of this girl, I mean, an immensely courageous thing to do, he writes to, to the, the Guardian and he says, um, yes, he, he points out the Home Office failed to seek his deportation. Uh, with Liberty's help, he says, he thanks Liberty for this, I raise my concerns about the Home Office's conduct with the parliamentary ombudsman who put my concerns to the Home Office. It now admits it never tried to deport him. The Home Office has also admitted it was not clear with me about its power to deport and to that extent has offered me an apology. My daughter's case has been used and is an example of all that is wrong with the Human Rights Act. I want to be clear. I support human rights. We have no need for a new Bill of Rights because the Human Rights Act already contains all the protection we need. I support the right to asylum and rights of victims. I support the right to family life, etc., etc. Um, what I expect is for the Home Office to apply its own policies correctly, not to use human rights to mask its own failures. Well, he could have applied that. I mean, he's, he's being rather diplomatic or cautious or what in not putting the blame on the Prime Minister, but Mr Cameron himself uh, was publicly uh, attacked the uh, Human Rights Act and clearly was not informed that it was the Home Office's fault or else uh, didn't believe it. Uh, we've had a series of cases in which government ministers have, to put it, bluntly lied about cases involving the Human Rights Act which have, um, they have, they have said, uh, have produced injustice. Um, why then is there this, this vicious campaign against the Human Rights Act? Well, it's, if, you can, if you can explain it, you know, you may have a better explanation than, than, than I have, but it seems to me it's due to simple misunderstandings. Um, misunderstanding that this is a European uh, idea that's been thrust on Britain when in fact the Human Rights uh, co Convention derived from British lawyers and British uh, ideas. Uh, it's part of the general anti-European uh, campaign that's going on at the moment, has been for some time. It's also part of the anti-lawyer campaign. It's part of the, this idea that Human Rights Act and Human Rights is a sort of playground for lawyers, um, a way for lawyers to exploit and make money and so forth. Uh, and um, a whole lot of other complete untruths. I end with this message we must not underestimate the opposition to human rights because it's there and it's very strong but we must fight vigorously to defend human rights because human rights is something that belongs to all of us uh, it is vital to our 
own dignity. Uh, it, it's it's as British as as, as uh, sliced bread or whatever. I mean, it is not a foreign uh, invention, if that were a bad thing, which of course it wouldn't be anyway. Um, and it, it's something that we all have to fight for and defend. And I'm glad that this seminar uh, will focus on some of the more detailed areas where human rights have been undermined and attacked uh, and will, I hope, encourage all of you to uh, defend and support human rights in your work and in your, in your lives generally to the best of your ability. Thank you very much.